Uh, now, before we jump into the panel sessions and discussions, we have our plenary speaker to help us get started and set the tone. Uh, Dr. Transic, Jessica Transic, is a professor at the Institute for Data, Systems, and Society at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. Her research examines the dynamic costs, performance, and environmental impacts of energy systems to inform climate policy and accelerate beneficial and equitable technology innovation. Her projects focus on all energy services, including electricity, transportation, heating, and industrial processes. This work spans solar energy, wind energy, so renewables, energy storage, low carbon fuels, and electric vehicles, among other technologies. Please join me in welcoming Professor Transic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great, okay, thanks so much. It's really wonderful to be here today to have the opportunity to participate in these discussions. And I'm gonna be talking about uh, who will benefit from the decarbonization of transportation and I'll focus in particular on an example from research on vehicle electrification. So first of all, when we talk about decarbonization, of the transportation system, what do we mean? It's basically about not combusting fossil fuels in vehicles like these. So we can fill the vehicles more, we can use them less, and we also need to transition away from the current technologies we use that primarily rely on combustion processes and the combustion of fossil fuels in order to reach net zero emissions, we have to do that. And of course, our vehicles don't just look like this. We also have um, light duty, you know, in addition to the light duty vehicles, delivery vans and buses, we also have trains, we have trucks, we have planes, we have ships. And most of our vehicles do rely on the combustion of fossil fuels, as I mentioned, except for human powered ones. Uh, like bicycles and uh, some rickshaws and also sailboats uh, and electric two, three, and four wheeler vehicles which are um, becoming more popular and are growing um, in various markets around the world. So I think it's clear, you know, if we think about this major transition, all of these vehicles moving around, really the key role that they play in underpinning our economy, it's very clear to all of us that this is a major transition. It's gonna require a lot of investment and we really only have the chance to do it once or at least, you know, this first try will cover, will span decades and many people are gonna be impacted by it. So the question that I want to touch on today, as I mentioned, is this question, who will benefit from the decarbonization of transition? I, of course, cannot answer this question. I don't think any single person can, but I will share some reflections on part of an answer. And I want to first share those key reflections. This, these are really the main points that I wanna cover in this presentation and then I'll provide some background and, and some research results to back up these points. So eventually all of society, I believe, will benefit, but the transition period can be much more or much less equitable, and I think we all realize that that's why we're here. And that transition period, as I mentioned, is likely, you know, if we do it, achieve it is likely to extend over a couple, at least a couple of decades. And a couple, one main point I wanna to make today is that supporting an equitable transition requires careful consideration of individuals' preferences and circumstances and the diversity of preferences and circumstances prior to deploying solutions. So once we're already deploying solutions, there's been a lot of investment, there's been a lot of technology development, perhaps demand side incentives prior to that. 
and we really want to consider these preferences and circumstances in advance. And in order to do that, I would argue that we do need to develop further understanding and further ability to conceptualize of and model and quantify um, you know, these, the, the role that different solutions could play, taking into account human behavior, that includes human preferences, also technology limitations, what's physically possible. Uh, we have to develop this understanding in order to be able to do what I said before, which is to carefully consider these factors prior to deploying solutions. So this understanding at the intersection of human behavior and technology is essential for this ex-ante evaluation of solutions. And I'll go through this through an example um, of um, installing and investing in and developing really the technologies required for charging electric vehicles in a minute. Okay, and finally, uh, timely public policy incentives are essential for steering private investment. We know that much of this transition will ultimately be funded by the private sector, not all of it, but much of it will. But left alone, the private sector will, as it always has without additional incentives, move toward development of solutions that target the most wealthy uh, individuals, the we wealthier segments of society. That's where the higher profit margins are. You know, eventually the, the private sector will also then shift to thinking about other segments of society, but this shift needs to happen faster if we want this transition to be equitable. So those are the main points, and um, now I'm going to um, oh, I see, I'm, I'm one off somehow here. Okay, yeah, so now I'm going to explain more about why I'm saying this and provide some background. So first, let's start with the scale of the decarbonization transition. We're gonna review possible solutions and really the scale of the investment required and you know just develop our intuition for why it's important to get it right the first time. I think all of us have that intuition but we'll just review this briefly. And I find it useful to look at uh, emissions data. So here we're looking at carbon dioxide emissions data in order to get a sense of the scale of this transition. So what we see here is that since the onset of industrialization, of course, carbon emissions have risen. And the drivers of that is that human societies had the uh, desire and sort of the momentum was building toward utilizing technology to augment their own ability to exert power, right? So in the US, um, we uh, consume on average about 10,000 watts of power. A human body exerts, an active human body exerts about 100 watts of power. So in the US, we're walking around on average exerting about uh, the power of about 100 individuals. Why do we do that? Well, because this power is what drives a lot of economic activity. And of course, this power consumption is very different in different countries of the world, also within countries. Um, energy consumption does scale with uh, income, generally speaking. And so we have a very uneven situation around the world, but um, you know, economies are moving toward the direction of using more of this additional power. And most of that is coming from fossil fuels, which have this inherent carbon content that's leading to this increase in carbon dioxide emissions. There was that little dip in, during COVID, the COVID lockdowns, actually it's not that little, but it wasn't accompanied by a structural change, right? And so then as we went back to living as we normally do, emissions came back up and NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, confirmed that emissions of all three, three major anthropogenic gases, so methane, uh, nitrous oxide, and of course carbon dioxide hit record highs in 2023. So there had been some hope that maybe this curve was flattening out you know, then could bend downwards, which we do hope it, it will do, but so far we don't see a flattening of uh, this emissions curve, although the rate of increase does seem to be slowing. So that's a positive sign. 
And then of course, to stay below the target for limiting uh, global mean temperature rise that's been adopted by all nations signing on to the Paris Agreement, which is most, most nations around the world, the vast majority of nations. Uh, in order to stay within that global mean temperature rise, we need to see this rapid reversal of this rising emissions trend. So emissions would have to fall faster than they've risen for over a century. In order, and we have different lines here because the later you start, then the faster you have to drop your emissions because CO2 has a very long atmospheric lifetime. And time is short, financial resources are not un unlimited, and so we need to be careful about what we're investing in. We don't have you know, chances to do this multiple times. Now, one thing I'll say is there are a couple of reasons for optimism. I think. So, you know, if we look at this trend, what did underlie, what, what was behind this trend? It was actually a rapid expansion of technology. Now, technology is not perfect. It has many negative impacts. Any technology does. There are winners and losers, usually with every technology. But this is, you know, this rapid expansion or this rapid, rather, uh, increase in emissions came uh, you know, came from a rapid expansion in technology. If you want to bend the emissions curve down and reach net zero emissions, given the fact that most people aspire to consume more, many people around the world, let's say, about half or more, aspire to consume more energy than they do currently because they do aspire to grow their economies, to grow their individual wealth, to achieve a high standard of living that we already enjoy. So they do want to use technology. There's a limit to what they can do just based on their own human power. But they can get that power from other technologies that don't rely on fossil fuels. There's also a lot of room for increased efficiency in our economies, right? So there are changes that, that can happen that are consistent with bending the emissions curve down while also raising the standard of living and human well-being around the world. And the fact that we had this rapid expansion of those capabilities in the past gives me at least some hope that we could have an equally rapid expansion of capabilities in the future. Now, again, as I said, technology is not perfect. But at this point, given current global population levels, the standard of living that we either already enjoy or that we aspire to enjoy, it's definitely going to be an essential part of bringing about this uh, bend in this emissions curve. And we do have experience with growing technologies from the past, and the question is whether that can be done in the future with a different set of technologies minimizing what will inevitably be negative impacts um, and trying to make sure that the benefits will be equi equitably distributed. Now, another reason for optimism, I would say, is uh, that we have seen major improvements in the affordability of various key low-carbon energy technologies. So here I'm showing really the three standout examples where over the last few decades, we've seen exponential improvement in costs in solar energy, wind energy, and lithium ion batteries. So the lower, the bottom row here shows this data on a semi-log scale for those that are interested in this sort of thing. Um, the fact that these are close to a straight line gives us some evidence that these are following exponential improvement uh, curve. So Moore's law is actually not just for computers. You see many technologies show <laughs> exponential improvement. Um, now, this plot on the right, the lithium-ion battery technologies, this cost curve here, this reduction is in cost, is a big reason why people talk about um, our, and, and why markets for electric vehicles are growing so rapidly. This is a big reason behind the interest, the increasing interest in electric vehicles. 
And it's a big reason why if we look at um, the comparison of costs, what we see, and, and along the x-axis there, I'm showing the ownership costs, and along the y-axis, the greenhouse gas emissions. So that's including life cycle emissions. It's the emissions from electricity and so forth. If you want to play around with this data, you can go to the website carboncounter.com, and you can look at this. We're about to launch an update of this um, shortly, but this allows you also to look at different states where you may be living, and the emissions intensity of your electricity and so forth. But these little yellow squares here are the electric vehicles, and the reason why there's some over in the lower left corner, yeah, so over here, and actually the reason why this isn't just shifted way over here to where it was before, um, is in fact um, this trend, right? And the other thing you hear about a lot when people talk about decarbonization is that we can use electricity for lots of things, not just for transportation, maybe for industrial processes and so forth, and that we can decarbonize electricity. And a big reason why they say that is because of the solar and wind uh, cost curves here. Now, solar and wind are not the only technologies we probably need to decarbonize electricity, and there are other technologies that also have a very low what's called carbon intensity, so I'm showing those here. And those are you know, nuclear fission, which is viable in places where people want it, where they accept it. Um, solar thermal is really only viable in very sunny locations. Currently, with current costs, it gets very expensive because it uses direct solar radiation. And then I don't have hydro on here because of the limited expansion potential globally, but in places where there's already plentiful hydro, hydropower, that's another low carbon source of electricity. Okay, so essentially these trends, um, oh, and I wanted to say that solar and wind energy have a very high uh, resource size. They draw on a very high resource, a very large energy resource size that is quite well distributed around the world. And that is, you know, really one of, another reason why um, these trends are so significant. Really, these trends have brought about a major change in the discussion. I think it's also a big reason why countries signed on to the Paris Agreement, um, not because these are the only technologies we're, we're gonna use, but they are the ones that have changed the most in recent decades. Um, and then, of course, you can also, uh, for some amount of uh, fossil fuel combustion, um, you can use what's called CCS, carbon capture and storage, to reduce the carbon intensity of electricity from, from a coal or even natural gas as well. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but the electrification, uh, electrification basically using electricity is probably not gonna be suitable for all transportation services. So this is fr from a paper we wrote in 2018, but the picture is much the same today where we looked at different sources of uh, emissions from the energy sector, from different energy services. And I've highlighted here the transportation services, uh, the emissions from transportation services, the pieces of the pie that are pulled out are indicating those services for which uh, electrification using current technologies doesn't uh, seem like it's going to be workable, it's too high, co the costs are too high, it's not practicable. And for those services, we may need other solutions, but you can see that a big part of the transportation uh, sector and transportation services is shown in the pieces of the pie that are not pulled out. And for those, at least when you do a, when you have a look at what is technically possible and the, what's called the technical potential, also considering costs, it looks like those, you know, one could use electricity for those. Of course, these services are not, you know, the pieces of the pie that are not pulled out are the ones where we, um, you know, assessments show that 
the technologies are ready, they can scale and so forth, but they're not obviously being you know, adopted um, accordingly in markets around the world. And so there obviously needs to be some more development even to support those pieces of the pie that are not pulled out. But basically, my point here is that we may need solutions beyond electrification. So we may need hydrogen and other synthetic fuels. Now, some of you may know that if we're using hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, then this is actually another kind of electric vehicle. But um, we may want to produce um, other fuels through synthetic processes, like potentially hydrocarbon fuels, where the carbon is, that's emitted is then captured. Advanced biofuels is another option for the transportation sector. And then fossil fuels plus carbon capture and storage. And so that's just the idea in the case of transportation. What you would have to do there most likely is to have some kind of air capture where you're pulling carbon dioxide out of the air. This is currently very expensive. There are a number of companies that are working on it. It's not clear whether this is going to be a scalable solution going forward. And the other thing I want to point out is with any combustion-based process, there are likely to be some um, emissions of other air pollutants. And currently, with, when we look at the um, health impacts of the combustion of hydrocarbons, so mainly fossil fuels today, uh, estimates out there range, but uh, some recent estimates suggest that one in five deaths uh, is, can be attributed to fossil fuel combustion, and that does not consider the effects of climate change, so one in five deaths globally. And so it is important to look beyond just greenhouse gas emissions, you know, carbon dioxide emissions and other emissions of other greenhouse gases when considering these solutions. There are also demand side solutions that are very important to consider. Uh, so we can rely less on private vehicles. We heard, um, I think, uh, some very fascinating insights on that last night through relying more on public vehicles, public transit, possibly in some cases human powered transport. We can also change potentially routing and other aspects of operations to enable a supply side change. So in some cases that could allow for further electrification of vehicles. So if you have more short haul flights, for example, you could potentially have some, you know, some airplanes could be electrified. Overall, I think it's clear that the scale of this transition, if we just look at the transportation sector, is huge. If we look at the entire economy, it's also huge. Estimates range, there's a lot of uncertainty, but you know, economy-wide, this may require an investment of about 100 trillion US dollars. Transportation will be a significant portion of that. We expect to see major cost savings overall. So the savings that we'll experience, we expect to experience from that investment will be greater than that investment. So that's really important, but the distribution of those benefits will not necessarily be fair, which of course is what we're here to talk about. So now I wanna shift gears and look at a very specific example of investment in electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Because what I want to highlight is the potential risk of not doing some of the things that I talked about beforehand. So thinking about individual circumstances and preferences and the range in those, adopting timely public policy incentives to steer private investment in a beneficial direction for society, and I think, you know, we all know that this risk is there, but I think it can be useful, at least I find it useful sometimes, to look at a very specific example and try to quantify the, uh, the risk and really understand quantitatively, you know, how important this ex-ante evaluation of solutions might be. So in this example, the goal of the analysis is going to be to identify favorable charging locations uh, 
and charging power, so the power that chargers could have. So here, um, we're gonna be looking at basically how, I'm not gonna show all of this, but we're gonna look at how people travel around in their cars. We've looked at the entire US. I'll show an example of an analysis from Seattle. Uh, one of the things we learn is that most people have at least a few, a, a small percentage of what we call high energy days throughout the year where they travel further than um, they normally would. But on most days, they're able to meet uh, their travel needs with actually a low cost electric vehicle among those yellow squares that I showed before and without having to recharge if they have the ability to charge overnight or possibly during the day. So we're gonna consider the variation across individuals. Uh, travel behaviors vary across individuals, of course, but also across days of the week and the year. In this particular Seattle, uh, study focused on Seattle, we're gonna look at the results of an analysis based on longitudinal data where we followed a sample of individuals throughout the year and you know you have holidays, you have weekends, you have weeks, et cetera. So your, your travel behaviors change across those different days. And specifically, we're gonna be paying attention to when the vehicles are being driven, when they're being parked, and where, what types of locations, and for how long. And I'll show this in a minute, but when we pay attention to how the vehicles are driven, we actually need very high resolution data in order to get an accurate estimate of the energy consumption of these trips, which ultimately is what we need to accurately estimate where chargers would need to be placed in order to meet people's needs. And in this study, we're focusing also on convenience so we're trying to minimize the delays that people would experience uh, because they have to charge their vehicles. And that's you know, very important. It's not just an inconvenience. I called it convenience, but you know, it's, it's something that is, is very critical. Um, it's difficult to estimate quantitatively that value of time, so I'm not going to do that here because some of the traditional ways that that's done takes into account income levels and so forth. But what we know, of course, is that for many individuals that have lower income levels, it's actually ultra important to have that convenience because those delays, you know, there's just very little time to play with in the day. They may, people may be working multiple jobs and, and so forth, and there's just a lot of demands on everybody's time. So we're gonna look at minimizing the delays. And, and let me just say that the results that I'll show you all limit delays to about, there may be like on the order of maybe five days per year per person where they have to delay their, or sorry, um, it's gonna be more like, I think it's more like 15 days um, per year per person. It differs across individuals, but on 15 days per year per person, they might have to delay their daily activities by anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. So we're not able to get rid of all delays. I'm gonna be showing results for Seattle, but we've also looked at the entire US, and as was mentioned a minute ago, the density of roads obviously is very different across urban and rural areas, even across different urban areas. So all of that matters in determining these travel patterns. But nonetheless, as we're gonna see, there's a certain predictability in what kinds of locations and what kinds of charger powers you might want in order to enable convenient charging. Uh, we're gonna be focusing in these results on one sample vehicle, not because I'm partial to this Nissan LEAF, but because we want to consider costs as well. And if you are able to buy a more expensive vehicle, you know, out here to the right, then you're going to have a bigger battery capacity. You're not gonna need to charge as much. So we want to do this study for a vehicle that has a lower battery capacity. And this vehicle is below the average cost of a new vehicle purchased in the US um, today. So that 
want to point out that we have to be a little careful saying this is, or very careful saying this is an affordable vehicle because here I'm showing the total cost of ownership and the upfront cost of electric vehicles tend to be higher. And so that's an important issue to address uh, with public policy as well. And it is something that uh, the US government is, is trying to tackle, but I think more can be done to also incentivize companies to innovate toward that space of lower cost electric vehicles, which they wouldn't naturally do if they're simply considering their profit margins. So very quickly, I'm just conscious of the time here. I'm gonna go over the model that we need to uh, answer this question, you know, where to place chargers and what percentage of vehicles can we electrify with limited delays, if we consider this entire population, we'll focus on Seattle, but the results are actually quite similar when you look across the entire US. So basically where to put chargers and how many vehicles can you electrify if chargers are in those locations without people incurring significant delays. That's what we're gonna look at. I'm just gonna go through this really quickly because I know we have students in the audience and also other academics that may be interested in this, but I don't wanna to spend too much time on it. So what we did here is to consider travel behavior. So this is through our demand model. We think about household travel needs, the vehicle travel range requirements. They may not be using their cars on all days. Um, and then features of the, the built environment and demographics. And then we also have a vehicle model where we take into account the characteristics of the electric vehicle, drive cycles. We need this very detailed data, as I mentioned before, to get an accurate estimate. And we have to consider the external temperature and that gives us the realized range. And then we can ask, you know, how can we match charging infrastructure to, indivi to individuals' needs? Um, just a quick point, the realized range is not one number. So you might get a number, you do get a number when you buy an electric vehicle, but it varies a lot from trip to trip depending on how you're driving, how cold it is out, and so forth. So we wanna take all of that into account. Um, we developed, to do this, we developed what's called the trip energy model where uh, we take information and travel surveys. For the US, we're relying on the National Household Transportation Survey, which a travel survey, which is very, a great survey, I think, um, that the US government um, runs. And we're also relying on higher resolution GPS data, because that gives us that higher resolution of, um, you know, what are called vehicle, uh, velocity histories of trips so that we have that second by second travel behavior. Then we go through a matching procedure, we feed it through our vehicle model. So basically we're able to expand the coverage of the data that we have across the entire US so that we can look at the second by second travel behavior across all of these different uh, roads in the US. So that's what the trip energy model does. I'm gonna skip through this, I think, because we're short on time. But um, basically, just to give you a sense, you know, if we just use the um, EPA's miles per gallon rating, so the reported range for an electric vehicle, we would get an error of more than 20%. If we look at individual trips, a typical trip, we would have an error of 20%. So actually, those estimates are not very accurate. With our trip energy model, where we don't know the exact drive cycle, we can bring that down to less than 10%. And then if we know the exact drive cycle, we can bring that down to closer to 5%. When we apply this model, what we learn is that most um, individuals throughout the year have what are called high energy days. We can see that in this distribution here, where on the the y-axis, we're showing the number of days. On the x-axis, we're showing the energy uh, requirements, the vehicle day energy requirements. And you can see that basically I've taken the log of the y-axis values so that this distribution, this line is a straight line. If I didn't take the log, it would, come up, you know, it would look different. It would sort of come like this. And so basically there's this heavy tail. There's a small number. 
high energy days that individuals have. So if they want to use their electric vehicle on all days, you have to plan your infrastructure around those high energy days. We see a very similar distribution in the US. So you can see here, this is the US distribution, and that's the Seattle distribution. But I'm going to be showing results for um, Seattle. And let me just do a quick time check. We started a little late, but I can keep us on time. Do we want to stop at 10.30, or? No, no, I'd rather hear a little more from you. OK. 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 Great. I want to make sure that I leave time for, yes, for a discussion. So um, OK. So let me just show you some of these results. Um, so depending on where we place our charging infrastructure, the vehicle electrification potential is very different. The vehicle electrification potential is just the percentage of vehicles that could be switched over to electric vehicles while still meeting the individual's needs throughout the entire year without incurring delays of more than 10 to 20 minutes on a handful of days per year. Okay, so let's just look at the one line, which is home, work, and ubiquitous public charging. So that's the highest line here. So here what I've simulated are level two chargers. So those are relatively low power chargers. They're placed in sort of all locations where people might want to stop. It's not a very realistic scenario. They're placed all over the place. Very costly scenario, you can imagine. But still, you only see a vehicle electrification potential of about 20%, right? If we look at that lower cost. Now, if instead we, you know, we move away from this ubiquitous public charging, meaning charging everywhere, not very realistic, and instead we focus on home, work, and then fast charging um, on highway, along highways, you see that the number rises significantly. Oh, and one really important thing, by home charging, I don't mean charging for people that have off-street parking. I just mean charging wherever people park when they are at home, okay? Um, so you can see that that number rises um, very significantly um, to above 40%, right? So here we've added, we, don't, we no longer have the ubiquitous public charging, which wasn't real, very realistic anyway, but here we have fast charging And that's with these limited delays. Now, if you provide access to supplementary vehicles, um, or I should say, if you also allow for longer delays on you know, a small number of days per year, and those could be delays because you're making detours to charge, for example, then you can raise that number significantly. So here I'm showing the results where we have only home and work charging. Um, so here, we just have home and work charging, <coughs> right, and then we allow for four days of supplementary vehicles, four days per year, you get up to 40%, uh, 10 days you get up to 60%. And the reason why these changes are so big is because of that heavy tail that I mentioned before, these high energy days, this small number of high energy days. So these supplementary vehicles could be uh, rental cars, they could be uh, forms of public transit um, for long distance travel. And then if we look at this solution, adding in fast charging along highways, you can see that the numbers rise significantly. you necessarily want 
to have a system where you're focusing on supplementary vehicles. Perhaps delays are more favorable in some cases. Um, I do think there's a really important possibility, a, a really important uh, so potential solution where we're looking at publicly accessible supplementary uh, vehicle access. But what I do want to say is that the reason, you know, this kind of trend overall is what also lies behind the fact that most people that have adopted electric vehicles in the US today, up till now, are wealthier individuals and they have access to off-street parking. Why is that? It's because they have an easier time getting that home charging, that charging for when they're at home, and they typically have a second vehicle, right? But if we want an equitable transition, we have to you know, not design the infrastructure for those individuals. And I do think that the bipartisan infrastructure bill and also the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, has done a pretty good job in taking into account these underlying dynamics and how they've set up their incentives. But we really need to be tracking the success of, of that spending and really you know, seeing how well it's working. And we need to do more. I think we should be doing much more to expand charging uh, for when people are um, at home, even if they do not have the, the access to charging for when people are at home, even if they do not have off-street parking. So if we look at these results all together, I just want to, again, highlight the risks of not considering individual behaviors. I haven't brought in preferences yet. That's something we're working on. But individual behaviors and also technological constraints and costs of technology relate to those technological constraints. If we don't consider that ex ante in making these investments, then you know, the risks are very significant because if you you know, focus only on, let's say, home and work charging, you can see that you achieve, you know, very low vehicle electrification potential. Um, adding in that overnight public charging, that highway fast charging. You know, and then possibly that access to supplementary electric vehicles can allow you to go much further uh, with the same investment. I haven't shown on here ubiquitous public charging, but that would be a very costly strategy to pursue, and it would not be very effective. And you know, so randomly installing chargers at shopping malls, for example, is probably not the way to go. Um, but there are these strategic approaches that we can take, I believe, that will allow for a much better utilization of public funds to then ultimately incentivize and steer that much larger private investment. Now I have workplace charging in here because it actually has an, it plays an important role in managing the grid impacts. Just very quickly I'll show you that, actually I don't think I have time for that, but basically um, if we have workplace charging we can smooth out the evening peaks that you would otherwise see um, in, uh, in electricity demand, and those would be very costly for the system. And again, unfortunately, less wealthy individuals would probably bear the brunt of those increased costs. So workplace charging is important, not so much because of the convenience that it offers, but rather because of the grid impacts. Now, the final thing I'll say on this is that none of these charger locations work on their own. So it's really about layering on these different charger locations to match individuals' needs and the differences across individuals. What we see is that these packages can, can really uh, do a good job, and they can do a good job predictably. Um, but the different locations are not good substitutes for each other. And the way you can understand that is that we have different kinds of days per year. So basically, depending on what, you know, the kind of day you're having, uh, 
um, and also the differences across individuals and the sets of days that different individuals have, um, you need these different layers of locations of charging infrastructure in order to have an effective infrastructure. So I think I will actually wrap up here. Um, you know, I hope I've shown you that the risks of an inequitable outcome are very large. You could invest a lot of money in the wrong places and continue to just support wealthy individuals that, uh, you know, among the people that might want to adopt electric vehicles, you would really only be supporting wealthier households um, in being able to realize that outcome. There are certain locations that are strategic locations for chargers. Um, and then finally, effective infrastructure solutions must consider behaviors, technology limitations, and the nature of the prediction problem. So, you know, the future is not this, you know, we can't perfectly predict the future based on what's happened in the past. So we have to find those aspects of the future that are predictable so that we can make good decisions based on that. Okay, so I don't think I'll have time to get into the general reflections and discussions aside from just to say that I think there's a role for research to play in developing but also evaluating technologies early on. Policy nudges are really important in order to push and steer private investment in favorable directions, and we really need to be tracking the effectiveness of those, of those policies. And then finally, I just wanna add, I just wanna end on this, which is that I think all of this work that we're talking about in achieving this transition should be done through the lens of tackling the most urgent and important challenges, which are addressing the lack of access to high quality transportation services. Some recent estimates in the US, you know, 6%, it may be higher, of individuals do not have access to high quality transportation services. It's even worse when you look globally, over 1 billion people, and I think the number is actually quite, quite a bit higher. This has major negative impacts on health and well being. And it's really important to maintain and enhance publicly available transportation services. And that will take on different forms around the world. Um, the main collaborators, collaborators on the projects that I presented are uh, Wei Wei, a former student who's now a faculty member at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and Zach Nidell, who is a scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Um, we work on all sorts of problems in this space, and you know, I'd be happy to interact with any of you. I'll stop here so that we hopefully have some time for uh, questions and discussion. So thank you so much. <laughs>